Hello, everyone, and welcome to this talk, which is going to be about uh, correlating profiling with tracing. My name is Christos Kalkanis, and uh, I'm currently working as a principal engineer at Elastic. I'm also a maintainer for the OpenTelemetry profiling SIG and uh, co-author and maintainer of the OpenTelemetry eBPF profiler. Uh, profiler is, profiling is quickly becoming entrenched in observability. Uh, as opposed to logs, metrics, and traces, which are focused on answering uh, what happened and when did this happen type of questions, profiling can reach deeper into the system and focus on the why. Now, in this talk, we're relying on CPU profiling that uses sampling to periodically capture system stack traces, uh, for example, 20 times a second. Uh, by running a low overhead CPU profiler continuously in production, we can obtain a higher level of visibility across our entire fleet, and that uh, lets us unveil unknown unknowns. Now, in this slide, we can see some of the benefits of continuous profiling, but uh, more specifically, uh, companies have difficulties uh, mapping CPU consumption to actual lines of code and also tracking performance regressions over time. For example, hyperscalers like Google have had uh, data center-wide continuous profiling for some time. Uh, Google has published a few papers about it. They call it uh, Google-wide profiling, and those papers have been very influential. But uh, generally, continuous profiling has not been uh, widely available. Contemporary profilers have problems uh, with production binaries that are usually compiled uh, without frame pointers and without symbols. And they typically don't support uh, high-level language runtimes without application instrumentation. It would be great if we could make a low overhead uh, continuous CPU profiler that's easy to deploy available to everyone. And this is exactly what we try to do in a startup called Optimize Cloud, which in 2021 uh, we launched a low overhead zero instrumentation multi runtime profiler. Uh, shortly after, we were acquired by Elastic, and in 2024, Elastic decided to donate the profiling agent to OpenTelemetry, whilst continuing to support and evolve its functionality. Our profiler is based on eBPF. It requires, uh, eBPF is a technology that lets us insert and execute new code into the Linux kernel in a safe manner without having to implement and load the kernel module. Uh, the profiler requires no instrumentation, no application restarts of any kind, uh, it gives us whole system visibility, starting from the kernel into code uh, running into native code and also code running into higher level language runtimes. We support uh, most programming languages that compile to native code, but also uh, most of the widely used higher level languages. And on the performance front, we aim for very low CPU and memory overhead because we want to enable running the profiler in production continuously at all times. Now, the typical case that we aim for is less than 1% system CPU and less than 250 megabytes of RAM. Uh, finally, the profiler uh, runs on AMD64 and ARM64 uh, architectures. Uh, it's an open project. Uh, I urge you all to, to contribute. And I have a talk on Thursday where I'm going to be getting into much more detail about the profiler, how it works, and also all the relevant work that we're doing in OpenTelemetry. If that sounds like something you're uh, interested in, please come and see me. And now, without further ado, I will pass this on to Jonas. So, um, so far, we've heard from Christos why profiling is nice, why continuous profiling uh, is, gives you a lot of benefits. But uh, with open telemetry, it is not only a benefit of having a single unified API for collecting all kinds of, of signals, but also to allow an easy correlation of the data directly uh, based on correlations happening, happening while collecting the data. So for example, think of uh, logs and tracing. It is very common to uh, inject your trace ID and span ID into your logs so that you can easily jump from a logs to your traces and yeah, vice versa. And why shouldn't the same benefits apply to profiling? So uh, for example, you have your, your application called my app here, and it, you identify it based on your open telemetry telemetry. So you search in your solution for, for its service name. Now uh, that application suddenly has a high CPU usage. Now you want to find out where does that CPU usage come from. So best to uh, look into the profiling data and wouldn't it be neat to be able to do that just on the open telemetry service name. And yeah, it's 
for uh, for for traces, it's it's the same thing. So, uh, for example, imagine that your get foo endpoint seems to uh, seems to have a high latency, which you can't explain with with I/O. So it would be great to to look at the CPU usage focused on that single endpoint. So in the open telemetry world, you would have traces on, and spans for for that endpoint. And wouldn't it be great if you can like get a flame graph focused on your filtered traces. So first step of getting there would be, of course, to add a profiler in your application. But um, that profiler sees the application from the operating system level perspective. So uh, for example, on process level, the profiler doesn't see the service name internal to your open telemetry SDK. It just sees the process name, uh, startup uh, arguments and process ID, for example. And similar on the individual execution level, the profiler sees the threads, their thread IDs, their names, but it doesn't know what the thread is actually doing except for the stack trace. It doesn't see the open telemetry traces on there. So um, one attempt we could take to correlate this data is to go through the operating system uh, view of the world. So for example, on uh, yeah, to do an indirect correlation on operating system level uh, resources. So, um, for example, we want to look up the profiling data for all instances of our My App Open Telemetry service. Then we need to do like a two-step query. We first need to find all container IDs and process IDs for all our service instances, and then filter our profiling data based on that which uh, yeah, is doable, but depending on your backend, that might involve uh, joints, which are sometimes not so nice for large data sets. And on the trace level, things get even more hairy, because um, what, what you essentially would need to do uh, is on the profiler side, capture the thread ID and the timestamps, and on the tracing side, do the same to bring uh, those two together. So uh, for timestamps, you have the first problem of clocks. You need to be very certain that the clock used by the Open Telemetry SDK and the clock used by your profiler provide exactly the same timestamps. Otherwise, your correlation is uh, guaranteed, to be, guaranteed to be off. And the next thing is uh, collecting a thread ID also isn't that easy because spans kind of be uh, belong somehow to threads, but it it isn't necessarily the same concept. So for example, in the asynchronous execution world, your span can start on one thread and later finish on another thread. And uh, for another example would be you have like a CPU intense task covered by a span, and that task spawns some subthreads or submits tasks to a worker queue. This means basically your same span does spend CPU time, but on other threads. That's why uh, we decided to instead go for an explicit approach of uh, explicitly correlating the data and not going through this indirect uh, at operating system level attributes. So um, how do we do this? The profiler can, in fact, in addition uh, to seeing the threads and the process name and stuff, see something else very important fr from the process, and that is native memory. So, uh, for example, you can, in your application, have a global variable pointing to some native memory space, and then the profiler will be able to actually read the contents of that variable. Similar, on a thread level, there is thread local storage, so each, each thread has its own storage space. And yeah, after some work, the EBP, eBPF profiler is also capable of reading uh, thread local storage values. And yeah, this capability now allows us to perform explicit correlation. So this means on the process level, we can um, write the service name and other resource attributes directly into the native memory, uh, yeah, in the process level native memory pointed to by a global variable. And similar on the, on the trace level, what we can do there is whenever, um, whenever the trace context on a thread changes, so whenever you, for example, make a spend the current one in the open telemetry context or that scope is then closed, um, we update the native thread local storage. So basically there is now two places where, where the trace context is stored. Once at, on the application side in the open telemetry SDK and on the uh, native side in the thread local 
variable. And the best thing about this is that we can nicely wrap this up in an open telemetry SDK extension. So uh, all the hairy bits and pieces get wrapped up in an extension you can very easily set up and run. So we've so far implemented this for uh, Java. And yeah, this implementation uh, ha has been done quite a while ago. So it is still for like the predecessor product of the open telemetry eBPF profiler, which uh, formerly was known as the Elastic Universal Profiling. So uh, this is still called Universal Profiling Processor. But uh, we plan on yeah, working with, with the open telemetry folks to get this contributed and have it go through like the standardization process so that we can also have it in the open telemetry eBPF profiler. So um, if you're interested, you can already find the source for this implementation on GitHub uh, via the slides. And yeah, here you can basically see the code snippet of what it takes to set it up. All you have to do is just start the span processor and at the span processor to your SDK and it it registers all the required hooks in the background. It uh, for Java loads a Java native interface, native library, because we have to write na and allocate native memory. And it especially registers a listener so uh, that whenever your your trace context changes on a thread, that, that change is propagated to uh, to the native thread local storage. And by the way, for Java, there is a new thing called virtual threads, which makes things uh, a bit more difficult because your Java threads don't exactly correspond anymore to platform threads, but that also works because the native library takes care of uh, keeping that native thread local storage in sync whenever the virtual thread uh, switches its carrier. So enough uh, talking about the theory. Time for a demo. We've decided to use the uh, official open telemetry demo. Some of you might know. It's a web shop for telescopes and related products, and it's built from built with lots and lots of microservices. So uh, yeah, we will be focusing on a certain Java microservice within this demo, which is the advertisement service, or short ad service. This service is a Java gRPC app which has just a single endpoint and it is responsible for uh, serving ads to users. It has basically two categories of requests it accepts, which are both served via the single endpoint. One uh, is to just serve random advertisements to users and the other one is for targeted advertisements. So this request then has a parameter uh, with the category of the, of the advertisement to serve and yeah, then serves uh, advertisements of the corresponding category. And those will have like the same uh, entry span name in the trace. That's why they are distinguishable via open telemetry span attributes recorded via explicit instrumentation. So this means that for example, for targeted advertisements, we get to see um, the, yeah, the category used for the request. And the open telemetry demo also has some neat features which are useful if you want to show CPU profiling. It's best if you also have a CPU bottleneck in there. So uh, the demo already has a built-in uh, CP background CPU usage problem which we look at, but uh, we've spiced thi things up uh, a little more and added some more problems. One of them being, uh, in addition, performing memory allocations in the background so that we uh, induce uh, pressure on the garbage collector. And uh, we've also added some code path dependent CPU bottlenecks to, uh, to showcase yeah, the trace-based uh, profiling correlation. So let's jump into it. Let's hope that this works. So let's jump directly into the profiling data. And one of the best ways to view profiling data is using a flame graph. We can see here one. Um, for those of you who haven't been to earlier talks where this ex was explained, I will quickly go through uh, what, what this actually shows. So um, the profiler periodically fetches stack traces from your CPUs because that is where your application spends its time. You now take those stack traces and here basically order them by the stack traces, stack traces you see uh, most often on the left side to the least often on the right side. 
So uh, this means that if you focus on the left and especially on the wider bars, then you will uh, get to know where like most of the CPU time is spent. So in this case here, we see the flame graph for the entire demo cluster, which is like 15 or 20 microservices, I don't know. And we can already spot like half of it uh, being due to a Java service. You might have a guess which one that is. So like half, uh, half the CPU usage of our cluster is due to this service. And uh, the colors in the, of the bars, by the way, represent the technology or the language it is recorded in. So for example, here on the right, we can see a, a Python service in yellow. And yeah, we, we see that, for example, in this base event, uh, base event loop run forever uh, Python function, it spends uh, one, it costs 1.2% of the overall CPU usage of our entire cluster. So, so far for the continuous profiling, let's now actually use our correlation because what we can do now is not filter on the container name, but on the open telemetry service name. And what we see here now is basically the part of the flame graph just by, uh, it, which is just, uh, yeah, the CPU usage our advertisement service is responsible for. So we can then already see the first CPU bottleneck based on the, on the method names. We zoom in a little. And yeah, there is a function called problem pattern uh, CPU load logarithmizer run. And what this does, what we can see a little in, in its child calls is it in a hot loop periodically fetches the current time, which you can see even down to the, um, to the, to the system calls here, and then computes the logarithm of that. The logarithm doesn't show up, it, it shows up as this JVM hotspot subroutines because there are some uh, JVM intrinsics were used. And further on the right, we can see our back, second background uh, problem, which is the background memory allocation. But the interesting part of this is actually the CPU usage it introduces, because further on the right, we can see there are some, uh, some stack traces which have no green in them, which means there is no Java code running there, but it costs a CPU on a Java service. So if we zoom in there, based on the method names, we can now guess what it is. This is the garbage collector doing its duty. So we can even then see like, based on our allocation load, where does the garbage collector spend its time? Not, ev uh, not just that it spends time. So let's go deeper and jump to our trace level profiling correlation. We'll navigate to our advertisement service and look at it, the traces for its single endpoint, which is the gRPC get ads call. And we can scroll down and view the waterfall, which isn't that interesting for this service, but we can see there is like a, a dark gap in there where we don't know where the time is being spent. And apparently there is no outbound call or something, so yeah, might be good to look at the CPU profiling data there. So what we can do now is, again, navigate to the corresponding flame graph. And this is now the flame graph of CPU time spent for processing just for this endpoint. So now it doesn't contain our, um, our background CPU problems anymore, but just the time spent for answering these requests. If we scroll down, we see some gRPC stack traces, and then can spot here two main hotspots where both around, uh, where, where the CPU time is uh, distributed across both around equally. So on the left, we have some, have a function called Shash shenanigans, and based on what it, what it calls, we can see that it calls a message digest update, which is in Java a function to compute, uh, to compute the SHA hash in this case. And on the right, we can see that it also spends a significant time in random next bytes, which is actually interesting. So this CPU bottleneck spends almost the same time in, uh, for computing random data, like hashing it. So yeah. And further on the right, we can spot the second CPU problem, which 
based on the name, seems to be a recursive Fibonacci number computation, which isn't the most eff effective way to do this. So if we now um, look at the latency for our endpoint, we can see that the distribution isn't like a standard distribution. There are some requests taking around half a second and uh, other requests, all other requests are below 100 milliseconds. So we can now try to find some correlations in our span attributes to see if we somehow get a correlation for where this higher latency comes from. And in this case, we are lucky because I pre-recorded the demo. Um, so we can see that the, 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 the context key span attribute with the value binoculars seems to be very highly correlated to the higher latency of that endpoint. So um, yeah, this, me, this, this span attribute uh, is used for the targeted advertisements to define the category um, for, yeah, for which the advertisement is to be served. So what we can do based on that now is filter our profiling data based on the span attributes. So we then get a flame graph, so we have, we've added a filter, and now our flame graph will only uh, show requests which are targeted advertisements for the category binoculars. So if we scroll through it again, we see just the basic gRPC stuff again. And now the hotspots look slightly different. So the hotspots are still the same, but now it spends a much bigger share of its time computing the Fibonacci numbers. And yeah, the, the, the hashing is now only around 10%, so there seems to be a difference here. And something else we can do now is look at the inverse set. So we can now afterwards uh, look at all requests which are not targeted advertisements for binoculars. And then if you look at the flame graph, again, just our GRPC stack frames. And if we look at the hotspots now, we can see that actually the Fibonacci computation doesn't appear here anymore. So it looks like the Fibonacci computation does only happen for targeted advertisements for binoculars. Don't know why that is required, but seems to be the case here. So, so far for the demo and also for the presentation, first of all, thanks for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, because we are short on time, and uh, you can e reach out to Christos or me, and yeah, we are also available on the CNCF Slack. We've got plenty of time for questions. You're just holding them back from lunch. Ah, here. I'm, uh, I'm curious. You, you mentioned you collect thread local information, mm -hmm. and then you collect the stack trace. How do you make sure this is like atomic operation and you get both for the right? Um, so when the, when the profiler collects its stack trace, it basically r interrupts the application thread and runs on that thread. <laughs> So you are guaranteed that no one else is modifying that thread local at that time because you are the one who could modify it. That's wh why it's atomic. Right. We've also added some like memory barriers in case the profiler happens to interrupt uh, the process exactly at the time that it is trying to update the thread local storage. So that is also detected. Any other questions? Yeah. Hold on one second, I'll be right there. <laughs> Sort of a follow-up question to what, um, mm -hmm. um, what sort of a overhead does it impose when this kind of instrumentation happens? You mean for syncing from Java the uh, trace context to uh, to the native thread local storage? Yes, so and then the, you also mentioned that you actually, um, um, you explained that you, just to make sure it's atomic, you have to sort of, you know, uh, lock into that thread yeah, local. That's what I wanted to. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like a, a memory barrier. So it's it, it's not an atomic, just a memory barrier ensuring. A, actually, it's not the memory barrier isn't even required. It's just we use the volatile write in Java. You because you run on the same thread. That's why you're basically guaranteed to uh, that it works, and you don't have a reorder. That's why we added the volatile. And for the overhead of writing. 
Java has always the problem that when you try to do something native, you have to go to Java native interface, which is slow. And what we've done instead is wrap uh, the, native thread the native thread local storage in a byte buffer, so a Java construct, and that gets optimized by the JVM that it's just a memory write. So yeah, the overhead is basically just serializing the trace to, to, uh, to op rather deserializing the hex and having it as a binary and writing that to, to memory. So it is in the low nanosecond area we've, we've benchmarked that. <laughs> 